you, John. Uh, this is the first time I have gotten to present something like this, so please bear with me. I'm a little, uh, feel a little, I prepared, but I thought that I would have my mom with me. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I feel like a little girl trying to, trying to cling on to that. But my name is Liana Hisako Tai, and I'm here today to talk about the history and ongoing legacy of my family's art. But before I begin, I must note that I was originally supposed to present alongside my mom, Amy Lee Tai. She is currently with her father, Mike Gung Gung, who is nearing the end of his life. My mom is very sorry to miss this amazing opportunity and to present with me and connect with you all. I dedicate this presentation to her and the perseverance she and her family have always shown me. So, who am I? I'm a creator and a recent graduate of Virginia Commonwealth University with a BFA in Craft and Material Studies. I live in Richmond, Virginia with my best friend and his two kitties, Muriel and Fig. I actually just got back from Penland at a two-week workshop that was my first time going uh, with Linda Nguyen Lopez studying hand building with colored clay. More specifically, I'm a craft artist and a creative writer. I am deeply inspired by my family, especially as of late, and make work about their experiences and my relationships to them. I am going to read the poem on the right there, which is written in the format of the exclusion order that my family was given to evacuate in the Bay Area of California. An attempt to reach. Liana Tai, written in the Bay Area, California. Instructions to all persons from United States of America living anywhere in the world. Please read with caution and expect to feel remorse, perhaps shame. And if you don't, read it again until you do. List of names, continuous, flowing through steel, carved carefully by a machine, though I could feel the care, through the chili metal. My grandmother was five when she stood on this block, 81 years prior, warm, perhaps chilly, maybe, wearing what couldn't fit into their bags, one doll held in her hands, my great-grandmother holding the other. Armed soldiers, a barricade, blocking them from the public as they waited for the buses, forcing them away. A list of those waiting on that warm, chilly day, perhaps, maybe, with belongings shoved into luggage only three days before, packing up their whole lives, some never to return, family heirlooms gone, lost to 9066. I reach out my fingers, flesh on metal, pressing so lightly over my grandmother's name, her name and my phone spelled the same. I'll hug her extra tight tonight. Mass hysteria leads to mass incarceration, leads to generational trauma, leads to perseverance, leads to continuing on even when the sentence should stop, leads to hope for peace. I fold another crane, one more closer to 1,000, but I don't know what to wish for. Perhaps, maybe, for us to feel safe in our own country, do we even want to claim something that doesn't want to claim us? That is a poem I wrote when me and my sister and my mom got to visit the memorial uh, statue at Hayward, California, where our family was picked up, including, I think it was 7,000 of them were picked up um, at that stop in Hayward. My mom was and still is always my role model. In 2006, she published her children's book, A Place Where Sunflowers Grow, inspired by her family's experience in the internment camps. Making art about this topic has always been something I never felt I needed to shy away from. Instead, it's a topic I've pursued since grade school. To take a few steps back in time, my great-grandfather, Monsa Sabado Hibi, also known as George occasionally, came on his own to the US from Japan in 1906. He became very active in the art community in San Francisco, co-founding the East-West Art Society with Chihiro Obata. In 1920, my great-grandmother Hisako Shimizu came to the US from Japan. She was the oldest of seven children, and when her parents decided it was time to return to Japan, she made the bold decision as an 18-year-old to remain in the US on her own to attend high school, same high school that her daughter 
and son, and later her grandchildren would also attend. Matsusaburo and Hisako met at the California School of Fine Arts, and in 1930, they got married. They started a family and had two kids, Satoshi and Ibuki, all while continuing to paint and exhibit in the Bay Area. I wanted to mention the relationship between the Hibi and the Obata families because it's extended over well past 100 years. Starting in the 1920s, Chihiro, a Sumi painter, and Haruko, an Ikebana artist, Obata helped Matsusaburo and Hisako establish their art careers in the Bay Area. When Matsusaburo and Hisako wanted to get married, Hisako went back to Japan for her father's blessing, and he actually was like, I don't like that man. But Chihiro was in Japan and helped convince her father to let them get engaged. So basically, we would not be who we were today without the Obatas. These photos are all of the Obatas and Hibis from decades. From Matsusaburo's memorial service, to when my grandmother lived briefly with the Obatas in their family home in Berkeley, to a year ago and this year with the granddaughters of the Obatas and the multi-generational descendants of the Hebes. The Hebes enjoyed a simple but happy life as an artist family in the Bay Area. In 1942, Executive Order 9066 forced them to leave their life behind and move to Tanfran Assembly Center, which was originally horse stalls, and then Topaz Incarceration Camp in Utah. This photo was taken by the famous Dorothea Lange, um, and it has been used in like murals all over uh, the country. While in the camps, my great-grandparents collaborated with other professional artists to build an art community. Matsusaburo helped Obata found the Tanfarin Art School that which later, when they moved to Topaz, became the Topaz Art School, where he and Hisako taught and the whole family painted. When Obata was released early from Topaz, Matsusaburo took over as the director of the Topaz Art School. Matsusaburo taught classes in oil painting, watercolor, drawing, sculpture, and the history of Western art, especially modern art. In addition to oil and canvas, he was prolific in his creation of woodblock prints, both mediums often featured animals. Matasaburo wrote, training in art maintains high ideals among our people, for its objects is to present, prevent their minds from remaining on the plains, to encourage human spirits to dwell high above the clouds. And a lot of the art we have for Matasaburo Hivi was only during the war. We kind of lost everything that would, came before. Isoko also taught classes in oil painting, watercolor, and drawing to adults. In addition, she taught classes in watercolor and clay to elementary school students. Her oil paintings often depicted a tender feeling towards children as well as between people in general. Isoko wrote, forever moving, changing the forms of human-made society in the vastness of the universe. I seek something beautiful with line, color, and form in such a way wishing to convey a message of peace. After the war, unlike the Obatas who went back to Berkeley and Chihiro went back to being an art professor, the Hibi started anew in New York City, but not even two years later, Matsusaburo passed away from cancer. Hisako was left to raise her two kids alone. She worked as a seamstress, but she still found time to take night art classes at the moment. In 1954, with Satoshi off to college, Hisako and Ibuki moved back to San Francisco so that Ibuki could attend UC Berkeley. Hisako continued to embrace opportunities to make and see art. And by the time she retired, she, from being a seamstress and also a housekeeper, she was leading a vibrant life as an artist in the Bay Area. Hisako wrote, art consoles the spirit and it continues on in timeless time. I can't go any further without talking more about my grandma, Ibuki Hibi Lee. Having grown up with artist parents, creating art was a natural part of Ibuki's existence. Before the internment camp, but during it, she took children's art classes at Topaz Art School and afterward. She pursued a more practical career as a physical therapist, but she has always remained deeply appreciative of art, both as a creator and also a patron. I would also like to briefly mention her old 
older brother, Satoshi Hibi, who has also pursued a more practical career as an English professor in Japan while making art on the side. After living in Japan for a few decades, he's currently residing in Japantown in San Francisco, where he likes to take walks by himself, even though he's not allowed to anymore. <laughs> when Ibuki was a mom of young children, she brought them to museums and encouraged them to make art. For example, having them paint murals on the garage wall and sitting them down at the coffee table to make Christmas cards. Later, when Ibuki's kids were out of the house, she started taking art classes again and spent her 50s making a lot of art, whether that was drawing, painting, working with clay, or even writing. Hisako adored her grandchildren, cooking special meals, attending graduation, giving them gifts. When she got her redress check for the internment camps, she gave each of her five grandchildren $1,000 for their personal use. I'm gonna take this away from my water because I'm a little thirsty. Later in her life, Hisako was actively painting and putting on exhibitions. The style of her paintings grew alongside her as she aged, becoming more abstract and expressive in movement, and conveying a message of peace. Hisako Hibi passed away in 1991 in San Francisco. Since then, my grandma Ibuki has been the guardian of her parents' artwork and documents. She has lent paintings for exhibits, answered questions for interviews about them, and so on. Although a lot she has done has been kind of invisible to the public eye. The most tangible work that she has done was editing Peaceful Painter, Hisako Hibi, Memoirs of an Isai Woman Artist, which also contains images of her mom's art and historical photos of her life. I have a copy here, it's not being sold, but it will be on the windowsill back there if you would like to take a look at her memoir. Speaking of books, after 18 years of being in print, a place where Sunflower Grows continues to reach new audiences with each passing year. My mom, Amy Lee Tai, has given numerous talks about her book in person and also online to both adults and kids. She has used it as a springboard to discuss various topics, including the history of the Japanese American internment and her grandparents' art. The entire process from writing to sharing her book has been deeply meaningful to her. I'm going to share the synopsis of A Place Where Sunflowers Grow. Can sunflowers bloom in the desert? Mari wonders if anything can bloom at Topaz, where her, where her family is interned along with thousands of other Japanese Americans during World War II. The summer sun is blazingly hot, and Mari's art class has begun. But it's hard to think of anything to draw in a place where nothing beautiful grows. Somehow, glimmers of hope begin to surface under the harsh sun. In the eyes of a kindly art teacher, in the tender words of Mari's parents, and in the smile of a new friend. The book process for A Place Where Some Flowers Grow felt like a family project of some sorts. Felicia Hoshino, the illustrator, met with my grandma Ibuki to help kind of channel uh, our great-grandparents' art and borrowed photos from Hisako's Tanfran and Topaz paintings, which helped inspire these illustrations. Uh, my uncle Mark, my mom's youngest brother, translated the story into Japanese, which making it a bilingual book. I will now read a page from A Place Where Sunflowers Grow about Mari and her papa. Every Wednesday and Sunday, Mari and Papa walked together to art school. Hand in hand, they shared peaceful, silent moments. Mari began to ask Papa questions. Why are we in camp? Why is almost everyone here Japanese American? Will I ever see my old friends again? He and Mama had resigned themselves to the internment, but Papa tried his best to answer. He turned to Japanese philosophy, noting the cycle of life. Spring comes after winter. The flowers bloom again. Peace comes after the war. Try not to worry, Mari-chan. It was as if with every drawing she created, Mari found another question to ask and the courage to ask it. When I was two and a half years old, my mom started writing the manuscript while pregnant with my sister Mia. 
You can say that while she was nurturing her children, my mom was also nurturing her family by honoring their Japanese American internment experiences. My mom is a very process oriented person in that she values and trusts the process of whatever something or someone needs to go through. While she exposed my sister and me to structured activities like piano and swimming, she believed in providing long stretches of unstructured unstructured time and open-ended materials so that we could create. Because of this, I have always been someone who creates. In school, I thrived most when there was a creative project involved. All three images on the right are school projects. The bottom center is a recreation of a scene from my mom's book I made in seventh grade. I ended up choosing the path of pursuing art with the unconditional support of my parents. To create is second nature to me, although it was only at the beginning of my senior year of high school I actually considered going to art school. Because of my great grandparents, I had equated art school with painting, which had never been my passion, and it was not until my college application process I realized there was a place for my kind of art in art school. The title of my senior capstone, Patterns in Hands and Fingertips, encapsulates the time, thought, dedication, and bloodline that I invested into this installation. It is currently on display in multiple locations around Raymond Farm. Paired with each house form, there is a poem about a subject relating to my family. A couple about the internment camps, one about my dad, another about my late cousin who passed when we were eight. All subjects that bring out the uncomfortable feeling I want the viewer to sit in and realize that they can move forward. As you can see, there is a through line found between generations. Even though I never met my great grandmother, she lives on through me. There are so many practices I did before I knew Hisako had done the same. Ceramics is my main medium, unlike her, but she was quite interested in the craft and would take classes later in life. I started pen paling when a friend moved away at age seven, and I have never stopped. Hisako wrote to everyone, her children, her grandchildren, friends, right, before, uh, right until she passed. Before I knew it, my use of lines and abstracted forms mirrored the way she would move her brush. Even though she passed before the turn of the century, Hisako's artwork has never been more widely acclaimed. My grandma has been tirelessly keeping up with the acquisitions and exhibitions by curators who want to showcase her parents' work. Another large task that has been taken on primarily by my mom and as well a little bit by me and my sister is archiving documents, photos, sketchbooks, letters, exhibit catalogs that all belong to Hisako and Matsusaburo. The Smithsonian has requested whatever we feel comfortable parting with, so over the past two years we have been slowly sorting through endless boxes in my grandmother's apartment. We have been gracious to the Obata family who have gone through the same and continue to go through this process with their own archives and with their help and advice it's been a little bit easier. My great-grandparents' paintings have been in the West Coast museums for decades. However, the first acquisitions that seem to draw national attention were those made by the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C. Two of the four paintings, one each by Matsusaburo and Hisako, went on exhibit quickly at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I would like to mention, this is Melissa Ho, the curator who helped the Smithsonian acquire uh, our, my great-grandparents' paintings, and she has just been amazing throughout this entire process. Hisako's work is currently on show with Pictures of Belonging, which is a national touring exhibition curated by Shifu Wang that features the art of Miki Hayakawa, Hisako Hibi, and Mini Okubo. Currently wrapping up its time in Utah, it will be traveling to DC, Pennsylvania, Monterey Bay, and Los Angeles over the next two and a half years. These are the museums and the dates that they will be at, and the book is being sold here today. I was able to go see this exhibition in early May because of the Topaz Art Pilgrimage, organized by Kimi and Mia Hill, the granddaughters of the Obatas. During this trip, I was able to visit the Pictures of Belonging exhibit, the historic site of Topaz, and the Topaz Museum. 
Because of the Mbatas, I was able to speak about my family to those who were on the pilgrimage. It was a beautiful, sobering, and uplifting experience to meet so many others that were affected by the internment camps, either personally or through family members. It gave me a lot to think about regarding my art practice, family, and place in the world. Getting to see the historic site especially was inspiring to be on the earth that my family stood and made art. They were in block 167B, which means nothing to anyone here, and I found that they had arranged stones where their front yard uh, would have been, and one of them was like in the shape of a heart, and I can't believe it's there all these years. I have to acknowledge that I am definitely not the only grand grandchild of the Hebes. There are eight more that come after me, including my sister Mia, who is here with me today. They each have a relationship to the internment camps, creating art and our family, which I don't have enough time to expand on. But know that there is a strong history being made that I am only just a part of. To end, I will read a poem of mine called I Come From Creation. My hands are from generations of making. Simply the act of creating with our fingers, palms, wrists, using them as tools to sculpt and shape and form. And from that, there's a new life, a birth. My fingertips have patterns found thousands of years before, pressed into fired clay pieces, visible or not. My knuckles are the same as those who dug up the dirt from the ground for the purpose of construction. I have become the blueprint that my ancestors followed. I am the definition of habits that are passed down through blood, and maybe they run thicker. So they dig, like the cycle of a wave, predictable, into the earth, and I come up with forms that mirror those they found in the soil. For too long, I have been left without a guide. Only then will I become what they have wanted for me, a recreation through craft. And through craft, I am on the road to becoming who I came from. Thank you.